Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished guests connected with us from all over the world. I'm Marco Battaglia, Head of Communications and Engagement at CDP. I'm pleased to moderate this session titled Scaling Up Public Development Bank Sport for Sustainable Development Programs. The thematic session on sports is co-led by IFD and uh, Istituto per il Credito Sportivo. We are in Italy, we are talking about sport. Let us share with you some evocative frames from last summer provided by our media partner, RAI. Abbiamo giuito. Abbiamo esultato. Abbiamo vissuto momenti straordinari e continueremo a farlo insieme. Rai di tutti di più. In recent past we have all experienced what a lack of sport means. Um, due to pandemic restrictions we clearly understood that physical activity is more than just entertainment. It is uh, a fundamental need. It is synonymous of freedom and well-being. Sport is at the crossroad of SDGs as well, including economic growth, women's uh, em uh, empowerment, and access to education. But sport and development finance words have yet to be connected. And uh, more and more, uh, investment in sustainable sport infrastructure must, be, must become part of development projects and initiatives. That's why we are here today. Uh, to focus on the role of the public development banks in this process. To start this session, I'd like to call on stage Andrea Bodi, president of the Istituto per il Credito Sportivo. Buon pomeriggio, grazie a Marco Battaglia, grazie ai presenti, grazie ai colleghi speaker che interverranno dopo di me, a tutti coloro che eh, stanno eh, osservando e ascoltando i lavori di questa sessione, così come i lavori in generale di questo appuntamento di straordinaria importanza di Financing Commons 2021, che nasce nell'ambito del calendario della Presidenza italiana del G20 e che G CDP eh, ospita. E ringrazio CDP perché ha affidato a noi la responsabilità di coordinare questo tavolo, di dare un contributo eh, di apertura e poi anche le conclusioni di questa sessione, che ha una, un nome che è perfettamente analogo alla natura del nostro istituto, ovvero l'Istituto per il Credito Sportivo, che definiamo non a caso la Banca Sociale per lo Sviluppo Sostenibile, perché riteniamo che tanto più nella nostra natura di banca pubblica per lo sviluppo dobbiamo certamente da un lato essere banca a tutti gli effetti e quindi rispondere alle regole del sistema bancario, dobbiamo avere una natura sociale perché riteniamo che lo sport per sua stessa definizione debba avere questa caratteristica, sia che si tratti di sport di vertice, sia che si tratti di sport sociale. Eh, lo sviluppo è un imperativo categorico che diventa ancora più importante in una fase come questa, della quale, nella quale di sviluppo abbiamo tutti bisogno per gli arretramenti eh, che l'economia ha dovuto registrare nell'ambito di questo anno e mezzo di sofferenze non soltanto umane ma anche finanziarie e industriali in senso più ampio. Eh, sostenibile perché eh, anche qui siamo nel perimetro della inevitabilità, anche se eh, poi in parte è anche un mio compito quello di eh, manifestare, almeno da parte nostra, eh, la profonda convinzione sul tema della sostenibilità rispetto a tante opzioni attraverso le quali ci si può confrontare su questo argomento. Il tema della sostenibilità, come ha detto giustamente Antonella Baldino questa mattina, Chief International Finance Officer di CDP, è diciamo, al centro del futuro e dell'agenda dell politica eh, e industriale. Però devo dire che eh, ci sono tanti modi di approcciare la sostenibilità che potrebbe anche sembrare semplicemente un'operazione di marketing e di comunicazione. Eh, per noi è una profonda convinzione che cerchiamo di rendere anche proficua perché la banca deve pensare anche alla profittabilità, alla redditività e anche alla redistribuzione della ricchezza che genera nell'ambito delle attività sociali che noi eh, sviluppiamo. 
Devo dire che per noi è una grande emozione e lo testimonio a nome dei 210 colleghi che rappresento, perché io non sono qui come persona, Andrea Bodi, al di là che sono effettivamente Andrea Bodi, ma sono qui perché eh, ho la fortuna, il piacere, l'onore di rappresentare una missione che ci è stata affidata e anche 210 colleghi che ogni giorno lavorano in modo appassionato, consapevole, competente in tutto il territorio nazionale, purtroppo soltanto in quello, vorremmo fare anche di più, ma diciamo che ci concentriamo perché già è sufficientemente impegnativo e rappresentando forse un'unicità nel panorama internazionale, cioè di una banca che si dedica esclusivamente allo sviluppo sostenibile attraverso lo sport e la cultura, che sono due argomenti che sicuramente viaggiano in grande armonia tra loro, in grande sintonia e possono trovare motivi anche di soddisfazione. Potrei usare il termine, no, producono un effetto leva stando insieme, non soltanto un effetto somma. Ritengo e riteniamo tutti noi che questi due siano tra i principali elementi che contribuiscono a costruire quelle che io definisco le difese immunitarie sociali. È un tema che dovremmo comprendere e apprezzare ancora di più in questa fase nella quale l'organismo umano ha bisogno di rafforzare le sue difese immunitarie e la società e la comunità non sono altro che la risultante della moltiplicazione della partecipazione di tanti soggetti individuali che determinano poi il contesto sociale che ha bisogno per contrastare le patologie alle quali andiamo incontro di rafforzarsi. Vi do un dato nella conclusione di questa mia introduzione eh, che riguarda eh, la ricerca che ogni anno il Sole 24 Ore fa sulla eh, qualità della vita nel territorio nazionale o meglio nelle province italiane, ovvero c'è una perfetta simmetria tra i vertici dell'indice di sportività che un'altra società elabora su presupposti assolutamente oggettivi, non quindi eh, diciamo discrezionali. No? Vengono assunti parametri che riguardano il numero di infrastrutture, la tipologia, la presenza dell'offerta sportiva nelle scuole, nelle università, il numero di tesserati, il numero di società affiliate, il numero di successi riportati ai vari livelli in tutte le discipline sportive, ovvero i primi dell'indice di sportività sono i primi della, eh, di, eh, negli indicatori della qualità della vita. È evidente, così come gli ultimi, purtroppo sono gli ultimi. C'è una perfetta relazione tra eh, lo sviluppo della cultura, dell'infrastrutturazione, della pratica, eh, dell'educazione sportiva, c'è una perfetta relazione tra questi elementi e il benessere che questi elementi comunque determinano insieme al concerto con altre entità in una comunità. Quindi questo certamente dà un senso ulteriore a questa sessione, non tanto per quello che ci diremo, ma per quello che comunque ci impegneremo a fare, perché io credo che al contrario di tanti incontri dei quali siamo spesso partecipi, queste sessioni di questi due giorni rappresentano fondamentalmente una testimonianza del lavoro fatto e un impegno del lavoro da fare nella logica della collaborazione. Quindi questo è lo spirito con il quale da un lato, come ho detto, siamo orgogliosi da ultimi arrivati nella coalizione del fatto che ci è stata affidata questa responsabilità di introdurre, così come di concludere, il riconoscimento del lavoro che, straordinario che la coalizione ha fatto e qui voglio ricordare non soltanto i colleghi dell'AFD francese che con noi eh, organizzano questa sessione, ma anche il contributo che insieme a tutti gli altri partner della coalizione hanno dato i colleghi giapponesi, tedeschi, russi, della Banca Multilaterale dell'Africa Centrale, dell'America Latina e del mondo islamico in collaborazione con il Comitato Olimpico Internazionale, il Comitato Italiano, eh, Internazionale Paralimpico, l'UNESCO e l'Unione delle Accademie Sportive. È uno straordinario gioco di squadra che ci porta immediatamente all'Agenda 2030, al diciassettesimo punto. Sul diciassettesimo punto tornerò nelle conclusioni facendo tesoro di quello che diranno i colleghi che seguiranno, perché credo che, come ho detto, da questo appuntamento usciremo con l'agenda non delle cose fatte, soprattutto delle cose da fare e che faremo insieme. Vi ringrazio. Grazie a Mr. Abodi per le sue parole inspirate, che rimarca l'importanza della coalizione e la sua azione. Però sappiamo che un obiettivo comune necessita di ogni sforzo, uno dei grandi obiettivi in sport. Uh, we have our other speaker, the other speakers right now. Uh, it is therefore a pleasure to introduce Mr. Takeshi Matsuyama, Senior Director from the Operations Strategy Department of the Japanese Agency for International Cooperation, the organization that co-chairs the coalition with the FDA uh, for the first year. Mr. Matsuyama, uh, I have two questions for you. 
As co-chair, could you tell us more about the coalition and uh, the progress made since its launching last year? And uh, AACA is currently revising its development strategy. Could you tell us? Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Matsuyama uh, from Japanese International Cooperation Agency. So first I would like to share the, about the coalition. Uh, the coalition name is the Coalition for Sustainable Development Through Sport, which is launched in November 2020. And the members are public development banks, uh, sport organizations, and international organizations. We share a common vision on the uh, uh, economic, social, and environmental power of sport, and a pledge to strengthen the investment and the expertise to build a sustainable world together uh, toward the SDGs. So we will seek projects setting sport as a systematic tool uh, for human and sustainable development at the national and the regional levels. Our hope is to expand by inviting more development banks, uh, private sector, civil societies, governments and academia. Uh, we have two working groups. Uh, let me share the progress. Uh, working group one is about sustainable sport infrastructures, uh, which are resilient, uh, sustainable and accessible infrastructures and will make positive impact on youth and the society and to job contributing to job creation, social inclusion, and they also will be environment friendly and toward the long-term development of the city. I have some examples uh, from the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and the Paralympics Games. Uh, for example, uh, timbers for the athletes' village uh, were donated by municipalities from Japan. And after the games, those were dismantled and returned to the uh, communities for reuse. And also another example is uh, much of the energy uh, for the games comes from the renewable sources, including solar arrays and the wood biomass power, which uses construction waste and tree clippings in Japan to produce electricity. So as a coalition, from next year, we will launch the market survey for sustainable sport infrastructure at least in the three regions uh, to identify pipeline projects for co-financing. And to explore the better financing mechanism for our sport to achieve the SDGs. Uh, focusing on social impact and the funding mechanism sport of a sport. So we found the innovation solution, but I don't mention in detail here. Uh, I hope my colleague uh, from UNESCO uh, to share the detail later. So in addition, uh, in terms of communication, the coalition developed a leaflet and a website for internet to map funded programs, sharing resources and networking. This is about our coalition. And the, another question is about the, uh, our JICA sports and development strategy. Yes, uh, JICA will be more active in sports and development. Uh, so far, we had dispatched 5,000 volunteers from 1965, which is a long history, and conducted some successful projects, uh, including peace building in South Sudan and women's sport promotion in Tanzania. So this year, uh, we launched the new strategy uh, intending to make collective impact through co-creation with the other stakeholders, of course, including this coalition. And we will plan not only to improve access to sports, but also to seek more projects to incorporate sport in other issues to solve, like uh, education, health, disabilities, gender, and the peace building, et cetera. Yeah, that's all about it. But uh, finally, I hope you to, uh, all of you to recognize that sports and development has a tremendous amount of potential for investment. Let's work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Matsuyama. Let's move on with uh, Mr. Ibrahima Wade, General Coordinator of the Organizing Committee of the Dakar Youth Olympic Games 2026, a great opportunity for both new generations and the Western African region. Mr. Wade, can you tell us uh, what you're planning to achieve with Dakar 2026 and the legacy you imagine to leave uh, the, to the community? And also, 
how are public development banks such as AFD and other stakeholders concretely helping you to realize uh, this vision? So opportunity to participate this uh, important meeting. Uh, but let me introduce by saying that uh, uh, Dakar 2026 Organizing Committee, Youth Olympic Games Organizing Committee, is a member uh, of, of, of this coalition uh, of development banks. And of course, we have the opportunity within our discussion in the two working groups to demonstrate how sports, how Olympic events can be the catalyst for social and, and economic development. And of course, we, uh, as we uh, get used to say in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, our working groups uh, uh, during session, the sessions, uh, Dakar 2026, as we are going to organize the first Olympic event in the country in, in, Africa, in Africa. So we have developed what we call a pre-legacy uh, uh, program, meaning uh, a transformation plan, how to use sport and Olympism to transform uh, to have a contribution on the, the development and economic uh, and uh, after all, even after, after uh, in the whole Africa. So we are, with IOC, we've developed what we call a transformation plan uh, based on the fact that uh, uh, we know, all know that in Africa, uh, there is a youth is facing uh, key challenges uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of job creation. So the objective is how to use this uh, first Olympic event in Africa to uh, contribute much more in the development by youth, with youth and uh, for youth. And we have started working in very uh, concrete projects with, uh, with IOC in terms of education program, health program, um, uh, sport, of course, a sport program and other things. And at the same time, we are working also in order to get through the coalition much more partners to be on board. We have already started working very closely with Agence Francaise de Développement, as you may know, and our major office, our focus is how to use sports to get uh, better, more uh, contribute to the development of uh, uh, use well-being in, in Africa and mainly in Senegal. So our objective participating in the program is what we are doing now with Agence Francaise de Développement, how to show other uh, uh, development banks that through sports uh, we can contribute, through sport we can contribute to the social development and we can go beyond sports by uh, helping young people through sport to get jobs, uh, to get through entrepreneurship. And of course, we already started after Agence Française de Développement discussing with major partners, mainly, for example, with UNESCO and very soon with GIZ and our partners in order to give them the opportunity to participate in this very beautiful adventure with us. So concretely, what we are doing, we are at the uh, session at uh, the, the step of writing the livre blanc with IOC team and after we finalize the livre blanc we will uh, come through the coalition and present this white book and also this major project that we want partners to come with us what i say in this wonderful adventure the first one event in africa thank you very much thanks to mr wade for giving us a vision uh, of the path that will lead everybody to an event of global importance, which uh, represents an opportunity to have a positive impact on people. And to talk about this, it's a pleasure to welcome Axel Klapake, Director of Economic and Social Development of the German Agency for International Cooperation. Uh, Mr. Klapake, uh, how can we scale up the investment in sustainable development sport programs from your point of view? And how do you think the coalition could represent a good lever. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm very happy to be here and very happy and I really feel honored to have the opportunity to talk here and to provide a, um, a humble input. I'm in particular happy to see also good 
colleagues of ours and close partners of ours also speaking here on this panel and I think it demonstrates again that we are operating already in a great spirit of partnership and alliances and I think this is really already a big achievement. I just want to start by saying uh, GIZ has taken this issue of sports for development very serious over the last years. So we have really tried to develop a pretty uh, comprehensive approach and a pretty broad portfolio of uh, different uh, projects, different types of projects, uh, because we believe, of course, in the power of sports, uh, in this power of sport, uh, really to boost development. And I think all these arguments have been mentioned already, why we so much jointly believe uh, in the power of sports to uh, help us achieve uh, or contribute to the sustainable development goals. For German Development Corporation, uh, we have already substantially uh, invested here in this realm. Uh, only between 2030 and 2022, uh, uh, we have provided in total more than 100 million euros for capacity building and technical programs in sports for development uh, programs together with partners. And many of those partners are represented here who are listening now to the discussions uh, together with those partners. We have already reached I think quite a substantial a substantial number of people and the target group in total we estimate of up to 1.3 million children and young people in almost 40 countries and it demonstrates again that what we are doing is not you know something we conceive in isolated projects but what we really think in portfolios we think in methodologies and we really think about how to scale up so I think that was also your question I think one discussion we have had a very um, very deeply, I think, in, in GIZ as we are doing the technical work uh, of uh, how to best design sports for development projects. Uh, so that we have dealt with the question, how can we best combine infrastructure projects with capacity building uh, approaches? And I think there is a clear motto uh, and I think there is clear evidence of how it can work. And the motto is clearly no sports ground without a concept. Uh, so we have had a pretty substantial program for the construction of sport grounds in Africa. But with all those operations, we always had the ambitions not only to leave some physical infrastructure behind, but really to make sure that we create an enabling environment for those uh, sports grounds that we teach, uh, that we teach the, the, the instructors that we bring uh, the local um, communities on board so that we really have long term uh, participatory uh, approaches to to actually uh, the actual use of those those uh, sport grounds and the really uh, embeddedness of those sport grounds in a broader concept of, of local social development. I think this was very important. I think it's also something we would want to contribute to the Alliance. Uh, I think another, of course, very important um, reference point for us is our work uh, in the context of bigger global sports events. The colleagues have already mentioned some of those. I think it's pretty much known that uh, also we as the German Development Corporation, GIZ in particular, we have uh, contributed to the FIFA World Cups in South Africa and Brazil and tried really to push the agenda of sports for development. Uh, and organize events during the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Rio 2016 and the European Athletics Championships in Berlin in 2019. And I think we have managed together with all those partners that are present here uh, to demonstrate and to showcase sport as a tool for sustainable development. Currently, we are hatching out new plans, uh, certainly also in partnership with many of the organizations um, being uh, present today for the upcoming European Games 2020 in Munich and the European Football Championships in Germany. Um, so summing up, I think we have a very strong spirit of working in alliances, joint commitments from different actors from sports, education, academia, youth and social sector. And against this backdrop, we extremely welcome the initial an initiative of uh, AFD to create this uh, great coalition, Sustainable Development Through Sport, a mobilized uh, public development banks to act. I think uh, this is, is very important. Um, and uh, we really believe that through this partnership uh, approach, uh, we can also contribute as a technical agency. Last year, we committed to becoming a strong partner to the Alliance and contributed our technical, methodological knowledge and international experience. And this year, again, we would want to 
uh, keep up with our work and we would like to reiterate and reinforce this commitment. So we are happy to be partner of this alliance. Congratulations, uh, colleagues. Uh, congratulations, felicitations for the key milestones achieved in the last year. Uh, let's jointly build on this momentum and keep up to our work, uh, our work on the European Championships in Munich. Next year, the Euro 2024 in Germany, Paris 2024, Dakar, and many other events. Thank you so much. Okay, let's say focus on people. Sports means social and economic uh, inclusion, above all, of people with disabilities. So it's a big honor to welcome Andrew Parsons, president of the International Paralympics Committee. Mr. Parsons, uh, two questions for you. Uh, can you share with us the programs uh, the International Paralympics Committee is promoting to include people with disabilities? And how can this role be fostered in the future? Well, thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be in this panel, uh, with especially with some organizations who, with who we work with, uh, with who we have been working in the last few years, as, such as JCA, IDP, and GIZ. It's a pleasure to be with you in this panel. Uh, in terms of the plans of the International Paralympic Committee for the next few years, we, in next December, we are uh, getting to the, to the end of, oh, we will approve a new constitution for the International Paralympic Committee after a long governance review exercise. And we are redefining the purpose of our organization, which, uh, so we will focus on membership and athletes, membership meaning the National Paralympic Committees and international federations, because at the end of the day, they are the ones delivering the pathways, the programs, and the infrastructure for the athletes. The games, and the games are our main product, if you want to call it that way, but it's the catalyst and it's a platform. And our role in the human rights, and our, our role in, uh, let's say, in inclusion of persons with disability through sport. So there is no identity crisis in the International Political Committee. We are a lead sport organization, but a lead sport organization that exists to make this a more inclusive world exactly through sport. Sport is the tool. Uh, so our priorities for the next few years is exactly developing our members, but in a way that they also advance the SDGs, but also advance uh, persons with disability and disability inclusion in different societies. Uh, we know that the games, they can bring a lot of progress when it comes to and, and, and put persons with disability at the top of the inclusion agenda. We just have seen the example now in Japan and Takeshi-san, arigatou gozaimasu for all your country did for, for the Olympic and Paralympic movement. It was incredible what you have delivered, what we have delivered together in Tokyo. Uh, and let's say in the seven year process leading up to the games, how we managed to start to change the way Japanese society um, perceived persons with disability. Uh, and through the games, and we have many examples of that in Japan, as I said, in Brazil, my own country, um, in Russia, in China in 2008, and even in advanced societies such as the United Kingdom. I don't know if you know, but after the London 2012 Paralympic Games, there are one million more persons with disabilities in employment in the UK, thanks to the change in perception that the Paralympic Games brought to the United Kingdom. So, uh, uh, but we want more than that. Uh, going to your question, um, how, how what we want, we want that in between games, we can also change the lives of the 1.2 billion persons with disability using sport. And we have many programs for that. One program I would like to highlight, we did in partnership exactly with the International, sorry, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, with resources coming from the Japan Special Fund for Poverty Reduction Program. So uh, this, uh, partnership with development banks and development agencies is something we have been doing since 2017 in a very successful way. We created a program in the in Latin America called On Your Marks Set Inclusion to benefit uh, persons with disability from vulnerable areas, from vulnerable communities, using sport as the tool, sport as the hook. So with that, we also developed the National Paralympic Committees. We attracted the, the private sector to these National Paralympic Committees and to these uh, sport uh, clubs for disabled people. So in some way, we started a revolution in those nations, allowing for, let's say, this wave of sport and inclusion through sport to, uh, 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 to get a momentum and to, uh, uh, to lead on. It's not something, an event that comes and goes. So we started something that becomes self-sustainable. Uh, so I, I would like to thank Maria of the IDB for this partnership. That was just the first edition. 
in 2017 is something that has been ongoing since then. And, and the amounts of money are not huge, but the results are just amazing in, in how many people we could involve, how many persons with disability, and the change in perception uh, from persons without disability towards athletes with disability, and then as a consequence, persons with disability in general. So we had a good example in the Americas. But the future for us, and it's not because we have Mr. Ibrahima with us, the future for us is Africa. That's why we are very keen in promoting uh, the next, uh, in, in connection with the next All African Games uh, uh, in Ghana, the first ever edition of the African Para Games. We do believe it's a fundamental opportunity to uh, make the Paralympic sport in Africa go to its next level of development, involve more governments. Uh, but of course, we need help to achieve that. We are also already in communication with some development banks and agencies to, to help us in this uh, endeavor. Um, it's very difficult normally to start an initiative like the, uh, the first ever regional uh, games. Uh, believe me, I know that I did that in 2007 with the Parapan American Games in the, re in the Americas region. But again, uh, we believe the future of the Paralympic movement uh, it's in the African direction. It's a continent that we st it still has a lot of potential and tough potential, but we need uh, to work on it. And we believe the African Paragames could be, again, a platform for the future development of sport for disabled in Africa. That's why we want uh, to open dialogue with different uh, development banks and agencies to help us in this project, to help us in this initiative. But in general terms, I want to congratulate you for the coalition. I think it's an incredible move. So uh, we know that the, the French Development Agency was uh, fundamental for that. My good friend Remy. Uh, so I want to congratulate, let's say, the community of development agencies for understanding sport as a very important uh, development factor. I believe the Paralympic movement, you can call it the embodiment or the epitome. It's so obvious what sport for persons with disability, what the Paralympic movement do to uh, foster for a more inclusive world. And this is not an exclusive to persons with disability. There are so many other marginalized groups that sport could be a very important tool for inclusion. Refugees, for example, and we do have an important program for refugees with a disability. Uh, but I want to just urge any member of the coalition to include uh, in your strategies to include more accessibility uh, and sport for persons with disability. I think we have 1.2 billion persons in the world with a disability, one in every seven human beings the world has a disability so the more the, the coalition can also include them in their strategies the better for a more inclusive world thank you very much uh, i tried to summarize things and i probably had used more time than i should thank you very thank much you. thank you mr thank parsons you. we're actually running out of time so i need to ask uh, the la our last two speakers to give us uh, quick uh, answers and um Sport is also a way to promote a real cultural change. So, therefore, I would like to ask to Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO, the main reasons why UNESCO decided to join the coalition and how can we foster investments in sports? Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's, um, it's great to be, to be here with you. Of course, uh, we have heard it all. Uh, the fact is that uh, in the current context in which we are, we need to leverage all of the tools that we have to enhance the development of our societies, but also the advancement of uh, the skills and competencies of our people. And sports provide this avenue. Um, we heard it on infrastructure, on skills, on, on social uh, cohesion. Um, and therefore, for, for UNESCO, this is a very important agenda. We were very proud to join uh, ADF, uh, but also the other development banks and the ones that are uh, joining us today uh, with this idea and how can we um, convey the, the, the fact that sports, it's, it's, a, it's a tool, of course, of happiness and <laughs> of uh, self-development, but it's also a tool uh, for development. Um, is not only the cultural part, I represent the social and human science sector of uh, UNESCO where, where we have a mandate on sports and we are the only institution that has the convention on anti-doping, but we also are an institution that are looking at how to integrate 
uh, what sports bring together um, to, to come out much more stronger with this uh, crisis that we are facing. We, we have a view that um, countries are going to be asked, and you are going to be asked, the development banks are going to be asked to, to invest more, and, and you're going to be asked to make up for all the downsides that we have confronted in the last two years. And therefore, uh, we need to bring together also the evidence on how much sports are not, is not only good for health, that is very well confirmed, is not only good bec uh, because it uh, addresses the question of obesity. We know that uh, it can decrease obesity by uh, 30 percent. Uh, but we know there are many other ills that sports can uh, develop, and therefore we were very pleased to um, uh, lead the work or to participate in the work of working group two in terms of um, leveraging the power of sports to achieve the SDGs. Uh, we know that 80% of uh, young people do not meet uh, the UN recommendations on physical activity. And we have also the looming crisis on health uh, and mental health depression and, and problems. And therefore, 80% um, women pulled in Europe equate participation in sports with an increase in confidence and decrease in anxiety. Uh, and we know also that uh, physical activity decreased by 41% uh, during the COVID times when vulnerable and low-income communities were hit. So we know, we know this. We know that the youth are confronting another pandemic with the mental health issues that have really increased uh, to 12, 200% even in the, in the youngest cohort. So in UNESCO, we are launching in November a strategic framework for implementing sports and development projects through the, our flagship that we call uh, Fit for Life. Uh, Fit for Life integrates sports, but also education, and, um, and, and try to address the question of inequalities, the question of inactivity, the question of mental health, all of the things by bringing together um, the different uh, ministries that are uh, addressing the issues, and uh, to develop, um, produce new data and targeted uh, surveys to understand how we could really um, make more out of uh, every penny that we uh, invest in, in sports. And we are also working with development partners, including the develop the, the business community, uh, to to advance this uh, important endeavor. Um, with the coalition, um, we have in the identified several assets that are highly relevant for public development banks. Uh, first, the good practices and benchmark. We need the evidence and how these programs can really uh, integrate a sport component. The specific data. As I mentioned, the return to investment, and, and according to a very robust and sophisticated UEFA model, investment in physical activity can save up even almost 3,000 US uh, dollars per year per person, uh, the impact investment uh, agenda. We also have identified a financial instrument that is particularly suitable for banks to prove the concept of sports-related investment, which is the social outcome contracting and, or social impact bonds combined with the above uh, evidence that I have mentioned, that can reduce the risk uh, for both upfront investors and the financial outcome funders, and they can uh, scale up investment on a loan basis. And the members of the coalition also provide substa substantial high-end expertise and the ground experience for the implementation for the sports and development uh, partners. We will be advancing a, a plan and a broad activity plan that will replicate a joint UEFA uh, European Investment Bank um, SOC, the Sports for Development Project. Uh, we are going to be identifying locations and pipeline projects, and this is my invitation to all of you of these kind of models, and a detailed implementation plan and memorandum that uh, will help us to use these SOC S4G model projects, including the selection of outcomes, the collection and transfer of data, the indicators, the stakeholder mapping and the legal and financial arrangements and implementation of proof of concepts should start in the in the year of 2022. Quality physical education service is going to be also supporting this work uh, and the upcoming fit for life baseline study uh, that is also resulting from the Kazan action plan because we host the ministerial meeting of uh, ministers of sports. Uh, and we will do essential data knowledge uh, transfer with WEFA's methodology to different regions around the world. So we are committed to the coalition. 
and we are going to take this uh, work forward in the design and implementation of these projects in different regions of the world with our field offices because we are all over the world that's another good aspect and we will continue working together with you to ensure that sports become a core tool for development in the coming years and also a core tool to recover from this crisis. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so Mrs. Ramos. We are unfortunately running out of time, so um, we have the last, last uh, speaker connected, Mariel Sabra, lead specialist uh, from the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, Mrs. Sabra, we only have really a couple of minutes left. Um, how can public development banks scale up support for sustainable development programs? Okay, thank you, Mr. Bataglia. For, for me, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to share my, our experience uh, from the IDB Lab. The IDB Lab is the innovation laboratory of the Inter-American Development Bank. And our reason of being is the conviction that the Latin American, the Caribbean, need to find new ways to accelerate inclusion and deal with the climate crisis. We have found that improvements in quality of life are dramatically different when we leverage innovation. We go from a linear path to an exponential one. So um, regarding sports for development, we work for the last 10 years and we have acquired quite an experience in that, uh, in that um, area. We use sports as a means for development, particularly to strengthen socio-emotional skills in disadvantaged youth. When we began this journey, uh, we did so convinced that the innovation could be applied to social development by combining tools that were already within our reach. So uh, we work combining sports such as soccer, rugby, hockey, um, that with, with technical training, and with that, we provided um, thousands of young people with the skills that make them employable. We work especially with the civil society organizations. So regarding your questions, we have I mean, acquired quite a lot of experience. Some of, I can share some of them if I have time. Um, the first one is that work on social and emotional skills is essential to achieve employability in the transition to adult life. Regional projects, some of my colleagues talk about regional projects, we, um, um, provide with cultural and idiosyncratic exchange. And at the same time, they allow basic methodologies to be adjusted in creative and suitable ways for each reality. Um, if we carry out the programs with civil society organizations, it's important to ensure adequate institutional capacity. And then, as Gabriela mentioned, a robust evaluation that provides uh, evidence to sustain this type of programs and policies is essential. So with that in, in our assets, we, we signed a, um, a partnership with the, um, with the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, that allows us to support the program Sportique that takes place in Argentina, Colombia, and Ecuador. And I will talk a little bit more about uh, scaling up through this project. What is the innovation in this program? From the technical point of view, we have combined sports with technology, combining practice with the priority learning nuclei that formal education systems identify in digital matters. So we are working not only with civil society, but also with, um, with uh, the formal education systems. In this way, young people give, uh, are given robotic training, digital citizenship, and programming. Um, we are working more with more than 7,000 students in Argentina, Ecuador, and Colombia, and we are reaching uh, teachers from the public education systems and community sports spaces. Um, we are working with more than 60 educational institutions and coordination with the National Olympic Committees in the three countries. Some points to highlight that we find valuable to, to share with you is how sport practices have been combined with more digital and technical uh, content um, so through the ages of social emotional skills. Regarding scaling up, for sure the most direct way to scale up is through the public policy. In that sense, Sportic allowed us to work with the educational system and that's a direct way to reach more youngsters in order to benefit them with the proposed methodology. On the other side, the scaling up could be replicating the model in different countries. Some of you, I think Alex mentioned that they want to, to work in different regions. 
And that's the idea. We're working with the IOC in preliminary ideas to expand sport to other countries in our region. And last but not least, the pandemic prompted us to accelerate virtual training. And that allows us not only to expand the reach of uh, reaching beneficiaries, but opens up to you new opportunities and challenges regarding scaling. Uh, not only scaling um, in, um, in the meaning that we can reach more people, but how are we going to reach them? And which um, tools are we going to bring to the table? Um, so this, this exchange of networks that is generated, what, what is it going to carry out? What does a young man from Quito in Colombia feel when exchange it with another one in Buenos Aires? Uh, how can we empower youth? How can we empower women through technology and sports? We think that's part of this scale up um, challenge and we want to bring it to the table to share it with you. So um, thank you very much. I think I'm very short of time. Uh, I'm glad to answer questions if you want to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sabra. Muchas gracias. Uh, this session has been a great opportunity to highlight the progress of the coalition and its commitment to promote investments into sustainable sport infrastructure projects. We, it's time for the closing remarks. I leave the floor to Andrea Abodi. Grazie. Mi sembra di capire che si è ridotto notevolmente il tempo a disposizione. Ho capito che la precisione è un fattore importante e i colleghi hanno giustamente tan avevano tante cose da dire e quindi io cerco di essere sintetico, confidando di essere esaustivo, sereno del fatto che comunque questo è un appuntamento di transito, è una tappa di un percorso di collaborazione che non finisce certamente qui, anzi ci siamo tutti impegnati a trovarci fra un mese e a ritrovarci di fatto nell'ambito di una coalizione che credo si voglia confrontare quotidianamente per cercare di mettere a fattor comune esperienze, soluzioni, strumenti, se è vero come è vero che lo sport nello specifico, così come tutti gli argomenti trattati in Finance and Common in questi due giorni di lavoro straordinario, rappresentano comunque una risposta al sottosviluppo, alla eh, periferia diciamo così, dello sviluppo e qui una prima considerazione. La periferia dello sviluppo e la periferia sociale non è concentrata in un luogo, non è concentrata in un continente, è in ogni paese, è in ogni nostra città. Quindi sarà importante che questo tema lo teniamo presente perché anche laddove lo sviluppo è sostenuto c'è una periferia che va a sua volta aiutata a recuperare il gap e a accorciare le distanze. Ed è del tutto evidente che una realtà come quella che la coalizione rappresenta che in qualche modo è presente fisicamente o collegata, ovvero 500 banche di sviluppo in 150 paesi, il 10% degli investimenti globali, 18,7 trilioni di dollari di patrimonio, eh, devono poter ritenere non soltanto negli intendimenti, nelle buone parole, nelle proposizioni, lo sport come un fattore di sviluppo che vada ben oltre lo sport. Eh, se è vero quello che abbiamo detto, ed è vero, quindi Takeshi Matsuyama è stato il primo che ha trattato questo argomento considerando appunto e dichiarando quanto nelle sue esperienze lo sport sia leva di sviluppo. Io vi do un brevissimo riferimento del nostro, della nostra banca che è sì specializzata perché ha due funzioni di scopo ma si sta eh, organizzando anche in chiave multidisciplinare perché è evidente che anche le misure finanziarie, penso al, penso al PNRR, non possono essere considerate soltanto nella loro attribuzione verticale delle singole misure, le sei misure, ma devono trovare anche dei momenti di trasversalità per costruire una matrice che metta in relazione i fattori e lo sport è certamente tra i più trasversali. Lo stiamo facendo con chi ha la delega allo sport, alla Presidenza del Consiglio, la sottosegretaria Bezzali, ci stiamo incontrando con la transizione digitale, la transizione ecologica, con la salute, l'istruzione, l'università, la ricerca, la coesione territoriale, lo sviluppo economico, le finanze, come possiamo immaginare che la contribuzione del PNRR eh, di 200 miliardi si concentri sullo sport per lo 0,35% o per lo 0,75% a seconda di come vogliamo considerarlo per quanto è stato attribuito. Diciamo che nella migliore delle ipotesi lo 0,5% su, vuol dire che lo sport ha delle possibili soluzioni nella necessità di interrelazionarsi. Ibrahim Avade, che ringrazio anche lui, gli eventi, il contributo dello sport oltre lo sport, considerando i grandi avvenimenti che sono certamente un momento d'attenzione. Un solo pensiero, ricordando un concetto che 
il Comitato Olimpico Internazionale, il Comitato Paralimpico Internazionale stressa, ovvero l'eredità. È fondamentale il grande avvenimento, come ci si arriva, l'importante è quello che si lascia e come si continua a produrre un effetto. Qui mi verrebbe da richiamare un libro di un grandissimo campione di calcio, non abbiamo visto il filmato, però mi auguro che tutti ricordino Dino Zoff, il portiere della nazionale italiana che vinse i mondiali dell'82, dura solo un attimo la gloria, che è quella del grande gesto sportivo della vittoria, che è quello comunque appunto della vittoria di squadra, ma dopo, così come lo sport ci insegna, nuove sfide senza mai accontentarsi nella misura in cui l'ambizione deve guidare in maniera saggia il nostro percorso. Due minuti e chiudo. Vado oltre eh, eh, e quindi vado a Axel eh, Cana Canape. Eh, il capitale umano, fondamentale richiamato anche dal contributo di Gabriela Ramos eh, nell'ambito della formazione, della qualificazione, del placement. Eh, anche su questo non possiamo immaginare che lo sport rimanga... Eh, un contesto nel quale, nel quale emergano soltanto i gesti sportivi. Un solo riferimento, lo vediamo in Italia, gli atleti che vincono, quelli che emergono di più, vediamo che hanno una preparazione, una predisposizione, una velocità mentale e anche un'adattabilità alle diverse condizioni della vita che forse vent'anni fa gli atleti non avevano. Sfruttiamo questo capitale umano formato sportivamente perché possa dare un contributo anche nella vita civile. Eh, Andrew Parsons, eh, che saluto eh, anche a nome del Presidente del Comitato Paralimpico eh, italiano, Luca Pancalli, che è uno dei nostri punti di riferimento, diciamo che nella sua missione c'è tutta la dimensione dello sport sociale al massimo eh, eh, livello e nella suo, nel suo significato più profondo e della sostenibilità, così come la immaginiamo noi, ad, ampro, ad ampio spettro, che guarda contestualmente, contemporaneamente, in una dimensione integrata, la dimensione appunto sociale, ambientale ed economica e non, posso, non può esserci sostenibilità eh, in uno dei singoli elementi se non interagiscono virtuosamente tutti e tre gli elementi. Eh, direi che più o meno Arian Hoffman l'ho richiamata sul discorso della formazione. Come ci lasciamo? È un appuntamento a un mese? Quindi io mi auguro che gli atti dei lavori di queste due giornate e ancora di più della sessione che ho avuto l'onore e il piacere di aprire e chiudere consentano ad ognuno di noi di stabilire una relazione diretta che ancora non è emersa perché devo dire che negli interventi che ognuno di noi ha fatto c'è il senso della sfida individuale con alcuni elementi diciamo, di trasversalità. Proviamo a entrare in relazione più stretta perché sono convinto che al di là poi delle reciproche competenze dei paesi nei quali eh, riusciamo a produrre i rispettivi effetti, quello che servirà è la condivisione. E qui l'ultima considerazione sull'agenda 2030, ne potrei dire altre, ma vedo che lo sguardo del moderatore è, <ride> diciamo, mi induce, senza leggere qui, fallo smettere, eh, eh, che devo veramente chiudere. Allora, eh, l'agenda 2030, come sapete, è un'agenda quotidiana. Io la considero, noi la consideriamo un po' nell'istituto, ci siamo un po' confrontati, una specie di enciclica laica, ce ne sono di altra natura, non voglio entrare nel merito di diciamo, sensibilità confessionali, però sappiamo tutti a che cosa facciamo riferimento quando parliamo di enciclica, questa la considero un'enciclica laica. Una richiesta, che è una richiesta quasi di premessa, metodologica, proviamo a chiedere a chi l'ha strutturata di rivedere la gerarchia e di fare in modo che il diciassettesimo punto, ovvero la cultura della collaborazione e delle partnership, passi al primo punto, perché senza quello gli altri sedici faranno comunque fatica ad affermarsi nel tempo. Grazie. Thank you, thank you, President Tavoli, for your final remarks. Thank, we thank all the speakers that joined us in this panel. Stay connected, because the closing session is due to start very soon.